So hello, everybody, and welcome to this month's um, ERCC webinar. I'm Roger Alexander, the Scientific Outreach Coordinator for the Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium. We're in a second phase of the consortium now. The initial phase was focused on understanding the biology of extracellular RNA as well as diagnostic and therapeutic applications. And in the second phase, we're doing more technology development, focusing on being able to analyze single extracellular vesicles and characterize um, xRNA carriers. Um, sort of in that vein, we're pleased to have with us Yizhu Dong of the Ohio State University. Um, today, he's going to talk to us about nanomaterials and RNA engineering for mRNA therapeutics, genome editing, and cell therapy. Uh, before you start, Yizhu, um, if people have questions throughout the talk, they can put their questions um, in the chat and I'll read those first at the end and then we'll, I'm sure we'll have time for people to unmute themselves and ask live questions. So usually look, look forward to hearing your, about your work. Thanks, uh, Roger, for the kind of invitation. It's really my great pleasure to share with you some of our recent uh, developmental nanomaterials and the RNA, RNA engineering for various uh, applications. So first, I would like to give you an overview about the research in our lab. We are focusing on developmental technology platforms, which can be applied to diverse diseases. The first uh, direction is uh, lipid or lipid-derived nanoparticles. We size uh, different type of lipids or lipid derivatives, and then we can formulate them into lipid nanoparticles. And uh, we can assemble different type of therapeutic cargos, uh, such as uh, sRNA, messenger RNA, or CRISPR system. The second platform is to engineer different type of RNA, such as uh, messenger RNA or genome editing components. The goal is to increase the protein production or improve the gene editing efficiency. The third direction we recently work on is adoptive cell therapy. For example, we can engineer macrophages uh, for treating infectious diseases. So today I'll introduce you several examples uh, from each direction. So messenger RNA has become a very promising class of drugs, and especially during the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic, there are two messenger RNA-based vaccines that have been used uh, in the uh, in many countries uh, against uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the meanwhile, messenger RNA has been used for many therapeutic indications, uh, such as uh, cancer immunotherapy, protein replacement therapy, and also genome editing. Although mRNA has become a very promising class of drug, delivery is still a key challenge for the broad application of these type of new agents in humans. So there are many biological barriers need to be overcome. So for this group of audience, I don't think I need to give a, little, uh, a lot of background about this. Uh, and uh, to overcome all these uh, biological barriers, we really need to develop a new type of biomaterials. And based on our previous experience uh, on the delivery of different type of RNA, we designed uh, this type of lipid-like compounds or lipid derivatives uh, shown here. And it has a long chemical name we just give it a short name, TT lipids. These TT lipids are composed of uh, a phenyl ring, three amide linkers, and uh, multiple lipid chains. And we can tune the carbon chain here from two carbons to eight carbons or even longer. And also we can tune the end lipid chains as well. Through this uh, very simple one-step reductive amination reaction, we can synthesize these uh, TT lipids in large scale. And this slide shows the overall strategy to optimize the lipid-like nanoparticles for mRNA delivery in vivo. The newly synthesized TT lipids can be formulated with helper lipids, such as the phospholipids, cholesterol, and the pack lipid. And here, the therapeutic cargo is messenger RNA. Through this microfluidic-based device, we can assemble them into very nice nanoparticles. Then we can characterize the particle properties such as particle size, data potential, entrapment efficiency, and also mRNA translation efficiency. 
we utilize the orthogonal experiment design, which can help us identify the optimal formulation with significantly reduced uh, experiment load. And after that, we can test the optimal formulation in different uh, animal models. And here's the in vitro screening. We formulated the TT lipids with the MRA encoding firefly luciferous, and then we treated a, a, a liver cancer cell line, capsule B cells. And on the left, the Y axis, that's luminescence intensity. And the X axis, that's different uh, uh, TT lipids. We can see TT3 is better than other TT lipids, but also much better than the control. Next, we studied the effects of phospholipids on the delivery efficiency. We chose three widely used phospholipids, DSPC, DOPE, and POPE. You can see DOPE formulated TT3 is much better than DSPC or POPE formulated TT3. So we chose DOPE formulated TT3 for further optimization. So here is a orthogonal experiment table. As I just mentioned, we utilize this orthogonal experiment design to optimize the formulation ratio of these TT lipids. And in this formulation, we have three components, uh, four components, TT3, DOP, cholesterol, and the pack lipids. And we assign the four levels for each component. And this Orange highlights that's original uh, formulation ratio because we don't know the effect of each component on the delivery efficiency. We just arbitrarily assign the four levels for each component. So four levels and uh, four components give overall 256 combinations. But using this orthogonal experiment design, we only need to do 16 experiments, which represent all these 256 combinations. And after an analysis, based on the results from the 16 experiments, we can predict the optimal formulation from these four levels and the four components. And then here on the right, this is a orthogonal experiment table. And from number one to number 16, that's 16 different formulation uh, ratios uh, for each component uh, and uh, each level of all these components. And the next, uh, we did the same in vitro study in HEP3B cells. The y-axis, that's luminescence intensity. X-axis, that's 16 different uh, uh, formulation ratios. And then we analyze the results. In this uh, experiment, we utilize the same firefly luciferase. So that means the higher Luminescence intensity is a higher delivery efficiency. And then in this uh, right table, so the K prime number, that's the total luminescence intensity for each component at, at each level. And we average that, that's a K prime number. And uh, so you can see TT3, the level one is best, DOP level four, cholesterol level two, and the pack lipid level one. And uh, at the bottom here is the predicted optimal formulation. More importantly, this, this experiment can tell us the uh, trend for each component on the delivery efficiency. And all these y-axis, that's the average luminescence intensity, x-axis, that's molar ratio for each component. You can see the lower molar ratio, the TT3, the higher delivery efficiency, the higher DOP, the higher delivery efficiency, Cholesterol molar ratio between 20 to 40, and the, the last pack lipid, the higher delivery efficiency. So this information is very important, uh, which enable us to further optimize the formulation ratio. Then we can do uh, several rounds of optimization and uh, validation, eventually identifying the optimal formulation for the TT lipids. To save some time, I'll just uh, skip that uh, process. And then we selected a model disease. Here is a hemophilia. Hemophilia is a genetic disorder caused by missing or mutation of factor eight or factor nine. Patients suffer from life-threatening bleeding or serious uh, complications uh, such as uh, joint bleeds. So in this study, we formulated TT3 with uh, 
MRA encoding human factor nine. And then we did an intravenous injection first day in volatile mice. On the left, the Y axis, that's the human factor nine concentration in plasma. And the X axis, different uh, treatment groups. And then you can see it showed a dose dependent recovery of the factor nine in mouse plasma. Similarly, we did the experiments in factor nine knockout mice, and this is the hemophilia B mouse model. You can see the trend is the same. Then we are wondering if these uh, factor nine pro proteins are active or not. We performed a factor nine activity assay, and this y-axis, that's a human factor nine activity in MIU per ml. X-axis, that's different uh, treatment groups. And the, here, the trend is the same. It also showed that those dependent recovery of the factor nine activity. At 1.1 milligram per kilogram, factor nine activity is around 800 MIU per ml. In normal plasma, the factor nine activity is uh, between 500 to 1500 MIU per ml in humans. So that means that TT3 is able to fully recover the factor nine activity to a normal range at this dose in these uh, factor nine knockout mice. And recently we collaborated with the groups of Runwise and Daryl Runway and we formulated a TT3 with self-replicating RNA encoding IL-12 for cancer immunotherapy. And here is an illustration of the strategy. First, we formulated the nanoparticles with the replica, and then we did the intratumoral injection. And the, it, it triggered a, a ICD, it's a immunogenic a, a cancer cell death, and then sub subsequently triggered the anti-tumor immunity. They performed the in vivo experiments uh, in many uh, mouse tumor models. Here are some examples. After a single injection of the lipid nanoparticle formulation, you can see in three different uh, mouse tumor models, B16 up 10, CD26, and the UMR 1.7, this formulation significantly extended the mouse survival. They also performed many maximum action studies. And here is the one example. We can see if we knock out mid-88 or STEAM, the therapeutic efficacy is significantly compromised. Meanwhile, we did a lot of chemical modifications of the TT lipids we installed uh, copper chains, branched ester chains, or linear ester chains on the scaffold, and we produced uh, these uh, functionalized uh, lipid-like compounds. And then we formulated them with uh, MRE encoding firefly luciferase, and uh, we injected uh, intravenously in mice and screened their MRE delivery efficiency in vivo. So on the left, uh, here, the y-axis, that's a photo of increase normalized by TT3, x-axis, different FTT lipids. We found that FTT5 is much better than other FTT lipids and also better than TT3. And on the right here is the characterizations of the particle properties. We can see the particle size is around 100 nanometers and the PDI is between 0.1 to 0.3. We also studied the biodegradability of these uh, different uh, lipids. We chose uh, two representative uh, examples. One is uh, FTT lipids with uh, linear ester chain on the right, and the other one is uh, FTT lipids with branch ester chain on the left. You can see both uh, particles showed a very low concentration in, in the uh, mouse plasma after intravenous injection. But in the, uh, in the liver, the lipids with a linear ester chain is cleared very fast. For the other lipids with branched ester chain, the degradation rate is much slower. 
So we can tune the chemistry of the TT lipids and then adjust the degradation rate of these uh, nanoparticles. Then we collaborated with a group of Dr. Denis Sabatino at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. We formulated FTT5 with mRNA encoding factor eight. And then we did the treatment in both wild type mice and hemophilia A mice. And we noticed that both the uh, uh, factor eight protein and the activity and the recovered to almost the normal range of compared with the wild type mice. We also performed a preliminary analysis of the histology uh, from the untreated mice and also the particle treated mice. We found that there's no significant change in these major organs, uh, heart, liver, spleen, lung, and uh, kidney. Then we collaborate uh, with uh, Beam Therapeutics, uh, which is a leading company for base editing. And uh, we formulated FTT5 with mRNA encoding base editor and also guide RNA targeting PCSK9 gene. And on the left, the y-axis, that's a base editing efficiency, A to G, X access different doses. It also do showed a dose dependent base editing efficiency. And on the right, that is, a, that is a one piece of the deep sequencing results at the dose of 0.125 milligram per kilogram. We can see here the base editing efficiency is still over 50%. So we are very excited about these results and uh, our collaborators uh, and also us, we think this is the most efficient uh, uh, delivery system for base editing uh, reported in literature. And uh, currently these materials uh, have been licensed uh, by multiple biotech companies and uh, further develop them for uh, different types of uh, diseases. Next, uh, I would like to uh, share with you our efforts on the RNA engineering. And the first example is to engineer the CRISPR-CPF1 system for genome editing. And CPF1 was first reported by the group of Feng Zhang at MIT. And this is a type of file CRISPR-Cas effector endonucleus. And on the left in the figure A, this is an illustration of the CPF1. It also termed as uh, Cas12A, and the purple is the CPF1 protein. It is functional through a single guide RNA. It can recognize the T-rich PAM region and induce the double-stranded DNA breaks. And on the right, here is the illustration of the guide RNA. It's a relatively short RNA composed of five prime handle, also called a direct repeat, and also a three prime uh, spacer or guide segment. And uh, this also includes a cedar region and the three prime permanent. So we know there are a lot of chemically modified uh, nucleotides. And uh, here are some examples, uh, such as the phosphosylate, two prime mesoxy, two prime fluorine, unlocked nucleotides, locked nucleotides. These are chemically modified nucleotides have been used uh, for modifications of sRNA or other type of RNA. So we are thinking maybe we can incorporate these uh, chemically modified nucleotides into our guide RNA. And uh, here we designed uh, various uh, uh, chemically modified uh, guide RNA, such as the uh, cell 8 at the full length, or just the five prime end and the three prime end, or only five prime end, or only to the seed region or three prime termini. So we synthesized this guide RNA, then we tested the gene editing efficiency. So we utilize a, a T7E1 assay, which is widely used in the gene editing field. And here, the CRWT, that's wild type guide RNA. So all other guide RNA, the gene editing efficiency is normalized with the wild type guide RNA. We can see several guide RNA completely lost their gene editing efficiency. But quite a few of them showed a comparable uh, gene editing efficiency. And particularly one guide RNA with 
five uh, two prime flooring modification at the three prime end significantly increased the gene editing efficiency to about 120 to 130 percent. Encouraged by these results, we think we can further modify the messenger RNA encoding the CPF1. And on the left here is a, a natural uridine, and on the right, these are widely used uh, chemically modified U, such as a 5 ME5 and also 5 MOU. So we produced uh, this uh, messenger RNA and uh, we utilized uh, ARCPF1 plasmid as a control. And uh, this is a generous gift uh, from the group of Hong Zhang. And uh, we found uh, one particular RNA with a uh, fine modification is uh, significantly better than plasmid and also better than other messenger RNA. Then we are thinking maybe we can combine the chemically modified guide RNA and the chemically modified uh, messenger RNA to further enhance the gene editing efficiency. And this, so we tested uh, this uh, combination in multiple cells at uh, multiple gene lossy. You can see the red color, that's the combination of chemically modified guide RNA and the chemically modified messenger RNA. It showed a consistent uh, increase of gene editing efficiency in three different gene lossy and uh, in three different uh, human cell lines. And then we performed a similar study in another CPF1 family member called LBCPF1. And we found that the increase is more profound. And for the combination of the chemically modified mRNA and the guide RNA, it showed a dramatic gene editing efficiency. But the combination of the wild type guide RNA and the plasmid, we cannot detect obvious gene editing. To further confirm the gene editing efficiency, we performed the targeted deep sequencing. And the, on the left, here is a on target gene editing. On the right, that's the analysis of off target effects. So we can see the chemically modified combination showed at least threefold better than the original combination with the wild type guide RNA and plasmid. And also, we didn't uh, notice any significant increase of the off-target effects. So encouraged by these results, we think we can further engineer the sequences of the RNA. And uh, in this study, we think uh, we already know like the untranslated region of the messenger RNA is very important for the regulation of the mRNA properties. So we think maybe we can engineer the five prime and three prime of the UTR and then improve the protein production. So that's our uh, study rationale for this. And we utilize the two approaches. One is to analyze the, the expression of the endogenous genes. And the, the other approach is uh, de novo design of new type of the five prime and three prime UTR. And uh, after several years of the uh, optimization and uh, uh, analysis of results. Then we identified a uh, lead UTR. We call that uh, NASA UTR. And then, like uh, last year, the, the COVID-19 uh, outbreaks occurred. We decided to utilize this uh, NASA MRA to encode uh, SARS-CoV-2 antigens. And then we did the uh, vaccination of the wild-time mice. Then we can analyze the antigen expression and also the specific uh, production of the antibodies. And the, here's the a, a initiation of the study. We think maybe we can analyze endogenous genes. So we found in the literature over 4,000 different genes and there's the results. We can analyze how many protein copies or amino acids produced from a single copy of messenger RNA. And then we can analyze and rank all these UTRs. We found that in particular one uh, uh, family that's uh, it's called a uh, RPS 27A. And it's a uh, part of the ribosome 40S unit. And in this family, there are two members. We give a short name S27A 
dash 45 and the S27 A dash 44. So this family, they have different five prime UTR, but they share the same three prime UTR. So we produced this MRI transcript encoding the Firefly luciferase. We also selected several uh, control UTR reported in the literature, such as uh, CYBA, AG, and also some engineered uh, UTR, AG plus G, 5AG plus G, and also no UTR. And then we found, uh, uh, we, all, we also like uh, uh, analyzed the five prime UTR sequence. We found that there are some top region, it's a terminal oligopyramiding region, which was reported negatively correlated with the translation. So we removed the re those region from the uh, five prime UTR. We generated this uh, S27A-45 prime, and also S27 A-44 prime. And we found uh, the, these uh, uh, messenger RNA showed a comparable expression of the luciferase uh, with uh, the best UTR reporting in the literature. In our study, we tested CYBA and AG plus G. And the next, we studied the three prime UTR. We chose some like uh, abundant uh, uh, UTR from different uh, Origins uh, such as the uh, same this uh, uh, RPS uh, 27A, or some from some viral proteins or transparent, and we found that these uh, UTR they they showed a similar like uh, level of the uh, luciferase uh, production, and then we uh, explored our second approach that's a de novo design. We set up several uh, criteria such as uh, medium like uh, secondary structures in the five prime UTR or like uh, only one like a uh, start codon in the sequence uh, AUG and uh, also we uh, uh, incorporate a codec sequence uh, in the five prime UTR. And based on the sequences, uh, we designed the uh, five prime UTR with uh, different lengths from 10 nucleotides to 90 nucleotides and from the left figure, you can see when we increase the length of the UTR and the uh, protein production efficiency is increased. But uh, if it's too long, in our case, uh, the production is reduced when it's reached uh, nu uh, 90 nucleotides. And uh, we also uh, uh, know the combination of this uh, AUGC is very important uh, for the uh, translation. So we also studied the uh, different uh, combination of this uh, AUGC, but we keep the length constant as uh, 70 nucleotides. Sorry, so that's the uh, uh, figure B. And the figure C, we try to remove any like uh, microRNA binding site. And uh, uh, we found that for this uh, particular uh, UTR NCA-7 and NCA-70, both are pretty good. 70 is slightly better than 7. So we chose this and say that 7D as our five prime UTR. And then next, we try to optimize the three prime UTR. Uh, in the literature, uh, there are many like uh, functional motif reported, uh, which can bind uh, with uh, different uh, types of uh, RNA binding proteins. So we identified uh, quite a few sequences. Then we installed the sequences uh, after the three prime UTR. So here are a few examples shown on the left. And we found uh, one particular functional motif we give name R3U. It's much better than other motif and also better than the uh, original like positive control CYBA, AG plus G or without motif. So after all this uh, optimization process, we selected this uh, NCA-7D as five prime UTR, S27A plus this uh, functional motif as a three prime UTR. And we gave it a short name like NASA UTR. And then we uh, found that there are more and more UTR reported in the literature and we selected uh, two UTRs, model one and model two as another two sets of positive control. 
And then we tested uh, the luminescence intensity. We found that after all this uh, optimization process, NASA UTR is over tenfold better than our start point. That's the original, like uh, uh, the first uh, UTR we tested from indoor stream. And also, it's uh, significantly better than the two UTRs uh, reported uh, in the literature. And the next, uh, we plan to utilize this uh, uh, messenger RNA to encode SARS CoV 2 antigens. And on the left, here is an illustration of the potential SARS CoV 2 antigens, uh, including the spike protein, nuclear capsid, membrane protein, envelope protein, and also this uh, receptor binding domain. And we first uh, produced uh, this uh, NASA. MRA encoding the receptor uh, binding domain. We would like to know if it still can increase our protein production. We found that consistently it's better than CYBA and better than the model two reported in the literature. Then we visualized the expression of these uh, SARS CoV 2 antigens. Uh, for all these five different potential antigens, we can see their like, obvious production in vitro. Next, we would like to test the in vivo uh, uh, activities. Uh, we then chose uh, two different uh, delivery vehicles. One is uh, MC3, that is uh, FDA approved uh, lipid formulation used for SNA delivery. And also, there are quite a lot of preliminary uh, preclinical studies that utilize uh, MC3 for delivery of different type of mRNA. And another delivery vehicle is uh, TT3 we just uh, mentioned. And after intramuscular injection, we, we found TT3 is uh, much better than MC3. And then we formulated this uh, two lipids with uh, spike mRNA, and uh, we defined uh, the specific uh, serum IgG. We found TT3 induced uh, over 300-fold higher specific uh, antibodies uh, than the uh, M3 formulated uh, formulation. Next, we compare the two different uh, administration routes, intramuscular injection and uh, subcutaneous injection. In our study, we found uh, intramuscular injection is uh, better than subcutaneous injection. Lastly, we did a uh, dose dependency study. We found uh, for both Spike MRA and the RBD MRA at high dose, there is a saturation effect. At the lower dose, there is dose dependent production of the serum IgG. Um, we also found that at lower dose, spike MRA induced a higher level of the serum IgG than RBD. It's also consistent with the literature report. Lastly, I would like to switch the gear to our recent studies on nanoparticles enabled adoptive cell therapy for treating sepsis. So when we design new type of materials, we try to from, uh, learn from the nature. When we walk into the pharmacy stores, uh, we saw many different type of vitamins. And the vitamins are very important uh, components. They have essential roles uh, for many cellular pathways and functions. And the chemically vitamins also possess very unique uh, uh, chemical groups, such as hydroxy groups, uh, charges, or like uh, hydrophobic uh, groups. And uh, here, for example, is uh, orange, there's uh, vitamin C, and we are thinking maybe we can engineer these uh, vitamins and uh, develop vitamin-derived uh, nanoparticles, and uh, then deliver messenger RNA to engineer macrophages, which can be applied uh, to treat uh, infectious diseases, such as the sepsis. So here, like sepsis is a life-threatening condition. This disease uh, affects over 30 million people worldwide. It remains the number one cause of death in hospitals. Although there's a significant advances uh, in intensive care and uh, antibiotics treatment, the mortality rate is still pretty high, around 
25 to 30 percent for this disease. And uh, about uh, 70 to 80 percent of sepsis deaths is related to persistent infection and also multi drug resistant bacterial significantly uh, increase the challenge for treating this uh, disease. Meanwhile, for sepsis patients, uh, these infections uh, severely paralyzed uh, the immune system of the patients, such as the macrophages. And so here are many challenges for treating this type of deadly disease. This slide shows our uh, strategy to treat uh, sepsis, especially the immune compromised sepsis. And we are thinking we can produce different type of vitamin derived lipid nanoparticles, then deliver antimicrobial components into macrophages. Then we can transfer these macrophages into the sepsis hosts, which can in enhance the innate uh, immunity and uh, also eliminate uh, all the drug resistant bacteria. To test uh, our concept, we first uh, synthesized a series of vitamin derived lipids. And uh, here are some examples, uh, vitamin B3, vitamin C, VD, VE, VH. And uh, we have a uh, amino chain here, which can interact uh, with uh, messenger RNA under acidic conditions. And we performed a similar screening assay, and here is a, in a macrophage cell line, it is a raw 264.7 cells. And the, from the left figure, you can see vitamin C is much better than other vitamins, also better than lufactamin, this a commercial, commercially available transfection agent, and also better than electroporation. And then we also found that the protein production reached the peak around the hours. Then we did uh, several rounds of optimization, as I mentioned, using orthogonal experiment design. After all these optimization uh, steps, we identified uh, one particular formulation. Here is a C5. It is over sevenfold better than the original formulation we tested for the vitamin C, and it is over 70 folds better than Lipofactamin uh, 3000, over 300 folds better than electroporation. On the right, here is a prior EM images of the nanoparticles. Uh, you can see these particles are relatively homogeneous in the uh, spherical morphology. We also studied the endocytosis pathway of the vitamin C derived uh, lipid nanoparticles. Uh, we selected three uh, widely used uh, uh, endocytosis pathways for particles, uh, including clustering mediated endocytosis, macropinocytosis mediated endocytosis, and also cavity mediated endocytosis. We first uh, treated these cells with inhibitors for each pathway, respectively. And then we treated another particles uh, encapsulating uh, fluorescent labeled uh, RNA. We found that if we inhibit cavioli pathway, the uptake of the particles uh, significantly reduced uh, over 95%. So we think cavioli is a major pathway to uptake these uh, VCLMPs. And the next, uh, we need to figure out uh, some uh, Therapeutic cargos uh, for this uh, VCLMP to overcome the bacterial invasion. And uh, here is a, a natural pathway one macrophage meet uh, bacterial, macrophage will uptake the bacterial and the form faxome. And then faxome fuse with uh, lysosome to form phagolysosome. For many bacteria, they figure out some like strategies to overcome the bacterial killing effects in macrophages. Uh, they can secrete a different type of toxins or different type of uh, agents. So we are wondering if we can block the immune invasion of these uh, bacteria and enhance the antimicrobial activity of these uh, macrophages. So we designed this uh, 
therapeutic cargo, we call that AMP can be MRA. This MRA is composed of three components. One is the antimicrobial peptide, and the second one is the enzyme-sensitive linker, and the third one is the capsaicin B, CAT-B. So the strategy is to utilize the natural translocation of the CAT-B to bring the whole protein into lysosome, and in the lysosome, the enzyme-sensitive linker is cleaved, and then release the uh, antimicrobial peptide. In the lysosome, antimicrobial peptide uh, can help to eliminate uh, the drug-resistant bacteria. First, uh, we would like to uh, confirm if this uh, CAT-B is able to translocate the whole protein into lysosome. So we produced a, a reporter mRNA encoded the enhanced uh, GFP. And uh, here is our uh, confocal imaging studies. Uh, and uh, the green signal is uh, GFP cat B, and the red signal that's a uh, commercially available lysosome tracker. And on the right, uh, here is a merge. We can see there's a really nice merge of these two signals. The Pearson's uh, correlation coefficient is around 0.91. So that means uh, these two signals uh, has great overlap. And after that, uh, we try to understand the antimicrobial activity of this uh, strategy in vitro, and uh, we used uh, uh, multi-drug resistant uh, s -aurus. and we have several groups uh, here, including PBS, free uh, uh, MRA, empty nanoparticle, and uh, also we have the particle encapsulate MRA, but we also treat the cells with uh, had to be inhibitor. And the last one is uh, particles encapsulated uh, the uh, AMP can be MRA. We can see at all different uh, time points tested, uh, there's a significant antimicrobial activity observed. And if we inhibit the cat B activity, if we, we cannot have the cat B transport the protein to the lysosome or like uh, if they cannot cleave the linker, then the antimicrobial activity is significantly reduced. Encouraged by the in vitro uh, results, uh, we moved to in vivo studies. We first established the immunocompromised uh, sepsis mouse model according to the uh, method reported in the literature. We first uh, gave the mice uh, three doses of the cyclophosphamide to suppress the immune system. And uh, then we collected blood from the mice to quantify the markers. And after that, we infected the mice uh, by IP injection with the bacterial. And uh, then this is a uh, immune suppressed uh, sepsis model. And uh, here on the left, that's white blood cells. On the right, that's uh, lymphocytes. You can see here is a normal level. After the model setup, there's a significantly reduced white blood cells and also reduced lymphocytes. So this is a consistent with the, uh, this uh, sepsis model reported in the literature. And then we give different treatments for these mice, including PBS and the PBS treated raw cells and also our macro cells uh, uh, injected IP and the macro cells injected IP plus IV. And we found that these uh, macro cells injected IP plus IV significantly reduced uh, the bacterial load uh, in the mouse uh, uh, blood. And more importantly, there's a significant extension of the mouse survival here, probably over uh, 60%. And for all the survived mice, their body weight continue to grow. And after 20 days, uh, we further quantified the bacterial load from these mice. We found uh, several mice that uh, they showed uh, no detectable bacterial, but the four mice, uh, they still have persistent uh, infections. So for those, for mice, we did a repeat administration of these uh, adoptive cells. And after another 10 days, we found that there's no detectable 
bacteria in their blood. And for all these survival mice, after 30 days, their white blood cells return to the normal level and also their lymphocytes return back to the normal level. And the next, uh, we try to mimic the sepsis uh, patients uh, by infecting these mice with a mixed uh, multi-drug resistant bacterial. In this case, that's uh, S. auros and uh, E. coli. And uh, we did a similar experiments and uh, we quantified the bacterial load and also we uh, monitored the survival. You can see there's a significant reduction of the bacterial load and also there's a a lot of mice, uh, they can survive after the treatment. Consistently, their body weight uh, continue to increase and these uh, white blood cells, lymphocytes are back to the normal range. So in, in conclusion, we talk about all these three directions. The first one is to develop a different type of lipid-like nanoparticles or lipid derivatives. And we showed a proof of concept of delivery of multiple types of MRA in different uh, disease models, such as uh, hemophilia for gene editing or for uh, cancer treatment. And uh, for the second part, we talk about uh, RNA engineering. We are able to increase the gene editing efficiency at least uh, threefold. Uh, we also developed some like uh, uh, gene editing inhibitors uh, due to the time limit. I didn't show the results here. And uh, for the second part of the RNA engineering, we were able to engineer UTR with the messenger RNA and significantly increase the protein production. And uh, we utilize this uh, MRA to produce uh, MRA by, based uh, vaccines against SARS CoV 2. And the lastly, we talk about uh, adoptive microbial therapy. We were able to develop a vitamin C derived lipid nanoparticles, which is able to deliver MRA very efficiently in these uh, macrophages and this uh, adoptive cell therapy is able to improve the survival rates in septic mice. They were able to clear the bacteria from these mice and uh, restore their body conditions. So for the next uh, five, 10 years, I hope we can integrate our specialties together with uh, other uh, collaborators uh, in several fields, including the biomaterials, RNA engineering, genome editing, immunoengineering, and uh, cell therapy. Our ultimate goal is really to translate uh, our knowledge and the technology into more effective treatments uh, for the patients in the clinic. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge my lab members. These are uh, group of talented postdocs, graduate students, undergraduate students, and uh, a few high school students. And uh, thanks our collaborators for their significant contributions uh, for different projects. Thanks funding agencies supporting our projects as well. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Very much, Yizhu. Let's jump into questions. Um, Anna Krzyzewski asks about targeting of the LMPs. Anna, do you want to ask that? Uh, hi, uh, sure. So, uh, thanks, first of all, for a, a really great talk. Uh, so, you know, a uh, question is about the distribution of your LMPs and, um, you know, different variants. If, um, what can you tell us about the, uh, you know, the broad versus targeted tissue? Uh, distribution. If you can expand on this, would be really wonderful. Sure. Um, generally, the bowel distribution can be tuned by the particle properties. Some particles um, are more preferred to liver, other particles more preferred to spleen or lung or some other like uh, organs. Um, so it's really case by case. For the first part, the particles we tested, uh, it's really great for for the liver liver applications, uh, and uh, also for some particles are pretty good uh, for intramuscular or other like uh, organs. But generally, I think uh, the particle properties is very important uh, for their eventual like uh, 
ball distribution and also for like in different organs, there are also several types of the uh, uh, cells. Uh, they can target different cell types. I guess to follow up on that, in your in your cancer immunotherapy um, work, I think you did in situ injection, um, you know, so that the the LNPs are right there. Uh, I'm used to of vesicles having you know signaling proteins attached to the surface. It's I need to follow up on your comment about different head groups. Um, trafficking to different tissues, but I wonder um, if you can if you could fold in um, adding a surface molecule to your LNP creation. Yes, process. yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, we can do that uh, um, very conveniently with a different type of chemistry. So, um, yes, we have some ongoing projects. We can target a different type of the cells uh, using their like a specific uh, ligands. Um, Zelchka McBride asks how you picked vitamin C, and I'll sort of piggyback on, on that. Am I correct that the, the vitamins that are, are head groups as an alternative to TT, and in your original orthogonal experimental design, I believe you looked at some other head groups, but was it, ju was it, was it just the um, design of experiments that led you to TT, or, or which other head groups did you take a look at? Yeah, we did check, check, check like a different type of the like uh, either hard groups or like a, or core groups that can install lipids around the core groups. Um, and the, for the for that project, uh, we the rationale is uh, for a lot of cells uh, re they really need uh, vitamins uh, for different type of their cell functions. So we think maybe we can incorporate uh, these uh, vitamins into the delivery vehicles. So we produced all these uh, vitamin-derived lipids, and then we formulated them and uh, tested in different uh, cell types. And then we found the vitamin C is uh, particularly good for uh, delivery in macrophages, designed all the cargoes and uh, uh, all the studies uh, following that. I really appreciated your use of um, orthogonal experimental design uh, in a previous life in aerospace engineering. I used it to, you know, it, it really enables you to explore a space of design parameters efficiently. I'm wondering if, um, well, first of all, one specific question, um, what is the entrapment efficiency parameter that you're optimizing? Is that the RNA getting into the lipid or some kind of lipid targeting to a tissue what 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 is that parameter um oh so that's the like uh, uh how much percentage of mra in, uh, loaded into the particles okay and my second question about about the method is um if it weren't luciferase if it it would you need to redo the the exploration given a different mRNA or a, a, a different disease with a different tissue target, or is there, or can you sort of, um, or not? Normally, if the RNA has a similar length, so, um, we don't really need to do the optimization again. We will validate the delivery efficiency. If we found that there's a difference of the delivery efficiency, we may like further for that, but normally, if like uh, two different RNAs, they have similar lengths, uh, uh, such as uh, the luciferase with another like uh, mRNA, they have quite a similar lengths. We optimize with uh, luciferase, and then we utilize for another mRNA. Normally, the delivery efficiency are quite uh, comparable. Um. And then your discussion of optimizing five prime and three time three prime UTRs um, in some of your work. Uh, one question is: Are you targeting translational efficiency or increased stability of the RNA, or both? And um, you said you were guided by literature for choosing the R three U and the NASR UTRs. Um, 
do, do you know the mechanism, like which RBPs they're binding to? What what the mechanism is that makes them successful? So we are still uh, explore that uh, for those components that's already well studied uh, in the literature. There are a lot of uh, results, like uh, for the functional motif, those are normally like from viral components. Uh, they can bind with uh, uh, RNA binding proteins. And uh, for the five prime UTR, that's uh, the lead UTR is based on the normal design. And uh, generally that's based on several criteria. Mm. So we, we, I think it, 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 really, it will be important to have more studies really like uncover, like if it's uh, increased the uh, translation efficiency or improve the half-life or stability, those type of things, we need to do more studies uh, to understand that. Thanks very much. Um, other questions? It's, I'm looking down my list, let's see. I think I think I asked all and, um, very much. That's quite a lot of work, and I, I it's interesting. The it looks like you're doing a good job getting collaborators to um, you know get these things out into the world. So thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to let everybody know that next month's speaker is going to be um, Stephen J from the University of Maryland College Park, and he's going to be talking about um, overcoming obstacles to EV based therapies. Um, oh, so we do have one more question. Um, Zelchka, do you want to add, just ask live, or I can read it if not? Probably, but if you if you read it, but anyway, I'm just. It's, I think it's very exciting that 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 you found actually a targeting molecule. Uh, from vitamins, so I'm just curious: Is there anything else that can be that you identified that's targeting to certain cell types? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So, we are trying to now explore more and more targeting more. And so, we hope we can identify some new molecules that can target uh, different cell populations. So, um, yeah, those studies are still ongoing. That's wonderful. Thank you. That's exciting. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> the Holy Grail. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Me okay. too. Thank Thanks you. very much for the talk today. Thank you. Take care. Bye.